All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Corrigan, or TC. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies at California State University, San Bernardino, uh, and I'm the coordinator for CSUSB's Master of Arts in Communication Studies graduate program. Uh, on behalf of uh, CSUSB's FAL Library and the Department of Communication Studies, thank you all for joining us today for our panel discussion titled The Social Dilemma Dilemma, Social Media, the Netflix Hit, and the Prospects for a Just and Humane Digital Society. Uh, for those who haven't seen it yet, uh, The Social Dilemma is a 20, 2020 docudrama by filmmaker Jeff Orlowski that explores the dull, dark side of social media. Uh, through interviews with former engineers and executives from firms like Facebook, Twitter, Google, Instagram, and others, the film argues that commercial social media giants have grave social implications, from digital dependency and teen self-harm to conspiracy theories and political radicalization. Democracy itself hangs in the balance. Timely, right? What does the social dilemma get right about social media and their consequences? What does the film downplay or overlook? And if our current digital media ecosystem is as troubling as the film makes it out to be, how do we go about creating a more just and humane digital society? In this panel, CSUSB Communication Studies faculty and graduate students will reflect on the social dilemma and the issues it raises from their respective interdisciplinary perspectives. Uh, we have a cast of thousands, so I've asked the panelists to please keep their remarks to three minutes or less so that we have plenty of time to take questions from you, our audience. You can submit questions uh, throughout the panel using Zoom's Q&A function. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to, to thank a few people and groups that help make this panel possible. Uh, thanks to CSU's, uh, CSUSB's Fowl Library, uh, per particularly, particularly Eric Milankiewicz and Robbie Madrigal for coordinating and promoting the event. Thanks to Finley and Information Technology Services for creating and managing this webinar. Uh, thanks to our uh, instructional student assistant in uh, communication studies, uh, Alexia Martinez, for keeping time and collecting questions during the panel. Uh, and thanks to the Department of Communication Studies and its faculty and graduate students. Um, few things give me more pleasure than thinking through tough media and social issues with smart, passionate folks like yourselves. Um, before I think, turn things over to our panelists, I'd like to note that pulling this event together was not easy, uh, and actually for some ironic reasons. Um, initially, we'd planned to do a to, to screen the film itself. Uh, however, Netflix's intellectual property policies made it all but impossible to synchronously screen a film over a, another platform like Zoom, uh, even for educational purposes. So, yes, a screening of a film about the consequences of the social media business model was done in by the business model of another digital giant, Netflix. Um, then we confronted the question of whether to move the panel to uh, a platform other than Zoom after Zoom's cancellation of a classroom conversation at San Francisco State featuring fa Palestinian activist uh, Leila Khaled. Now, um, think what you may about her uh, politics, but the notion that an ed tech firm would unilaterally cancel a faculty and student organized classroom discussion based simply on who's speaking should trouble anyone that cherishes academic freedom. Uh, ultimately, though, we went ahead with Zoom for today's panels, not because everybody agreed with Zoom's decision, uh, but frankly, because the platform is so thoroughly tied into the infrastructure and norms of our teaching and learning experiences. Uh, so yes, our conversation today will presumably focus on social media, but the implications of the digital giant's size, power, and commercial structure uh, permeate every aspect of our digital lives, including this panel. Um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to our first panelist, uh, Naeem Abarati. Naeem is a graduate student in the Master of, or Master of Arts in Communication Studies graduate program. His interests include digital media, political communication, and intercultural communication. Um, Naeem, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Dr. Kerrigan. Hi, everyone. I hope you are all doing well. So my name is Naim Abaradi. I'm a graduate student here at CSUSB, and I have been working as a social media specialist since 2015. And today, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to join you, to join our faculty in, ref, on reflect, in reflecting on uh, the documentary, 
Uh, one sentence actually that I that stayed in my mind after finishing this documentary, and I I couldn't stop thinking about it, which is Russia did not hack Facebook. It simply used the platform, and that took me to talk encouraged me actually to talk about two points here, uh, which the first one is how social media is used as. Uh, is used as a tool of a propaganda by some countries. And then I'm going to talk about how these digital platforms uh, have become a part of these country, of these specific countries' uh, propaganda. There are many features on Facebook that allow individuals, allow companies, allow countries to spread their propaganda. But one of the most important features is, go, uh, is uh, sponsor ads. These sponsor ads actually give uh, these company or these countries or individual even individuals uh, to give them uh, allow them actually to enter our houses without keys. They uh, you can you can promote anything on social media, especially Facebook, uh, and target anyone in any country in any space based on their and in their interests and based on their political engagement, based on other things that should be protected by social by these companies as uh, uh, because they are considered personal privacy for uh, people and customers on uh, Facebook. But these uh, these features and in particular the uh, good the sponsor ads uh, allow make it actually easier for countries to spread their propaganda. Uh, instead of censoring the social media itself, according to the to uh, Ruger Mc, McNamee, which uh, the an early uh, sorry, according to Mike Abramovitz, uh, the president of Freedom House, uh, in his statement in 2019, that said many governments are finding that on social media, a propaganda works better than censorship. So uh, this is the most dangerous thing about it. It just because countries these days cannot control social media as traditional media, social media does not have one center to be controlled or to, uh, or to be followed. Uh, but now it's easy just to go ahead and just to promote anything but paying somebody some some money for these companies. And the second point actually that um, I wanted to talk about is that these digital platforms unfortunately became part of this propaganda itself and by supporting actually by supporting what spe specific narratives over other narratives and one example that uh, dr kerrigan talked about it in at the beginning in his introduction was counseling an event called um whose narratives, gender justice and resistance, a conversation with Leila Khalid and at San, St San Francisco State University in a few weeks ago. And this event uh, was canceled actually uh, uh, in a response to a request by uh, Bro Israel, a group that uh, claiming uh, it's illegal to host Leila Khalid because of her aff affiliation with the popular front uh, for the liberation of Palestine. And this, this doesn't only support one narrative over another narrative, uh, actually, but it also, it also threatens the academic freedom. Dr. Ahlam Muhtasib, the, the, who's the co-director of the documentary uh, 1948, uh, the, the Creation and Catastrophe, said in her recent uh, article on in the Middle East Eye that uh, regarding that, Canceling the um, the event, it installed fear in many of my colleagues who are neither activists nor had any positions on Palestine. The fear of the end of, acad of academic freedom in our institutions of higher education. And uh, Naim, hey, I, I I really appreciate you bringing this uh, <laughs> this important point to our attention. I want to make sure that we have enough time for our uh, our other panelists. So uh, sure. we're going to go ahead and uh, I, again, I I appreciate your time and bringing Thank this you, important uh, issue to uh, to our attention. Uh, Dr. Gretchen Bergquist is going to be our next panelist. Uh, Dr. Bergquist is an assistant professor in CSUSB's Department of Communication Studies, and uh, her interests revolve around interpersonal communication communication, mental health, and identity. Uh, Dr. Bergquist? 
Good morning, everyone. Well, thank you for organizing this panel. Um, I was really excited uh, to get to visit with everyone. And to, I'm really excited to get to some of everyone's questions. And so I'm going to keep this very brief. But, um, you know, my thoughts are mostly centered around how this impacts our, our um, behavioral change and our interpersonal interactions, because that's my area of research. But one of the things that I was the large takeaway from this for me um, is, you know, in communication research, and especially in interpersonal communication research, we look at um, how these macro level influences are going to influence our behavioral change on a micro level. And uh, one of the large takeaways from watching this documentary is this huge power that social media has in order to produce behavioral change. And they do it through the tool of uh, attention, right? Our attention has been commodified essentially. And so um, I thought that it was incredibly interesting to think about, and I really liked that they brought up this point in the documentary, but um, long-term behavioral change and the power of, of our attention span to be used to produce that long-term behavioral change because for a very long time, that is what all of the researchers and practitioners have been trying to, to get at is how can we go about producing long-term behavioral change? Short-term is easier. Long-term is a lot more challenging. And so um, that was the large takeaway for me that I, I kind of wanted to throw out there for discussion. Um, the other thought uh, that was a large takeaway from, from this documentary for me is this idea of uh, these larger echo chambers that our usage is essentially creating and how that is going to influence our reflexivity to engaging in conversation and political discourse with ideas that we may not, that may not be consistent with our strongly held beliefs. Um, there's a lot of research that demonstrates that we're going to behave in ways that are consistent with the behaviorally relevant reference group. And so if we are continually being presented with information on our Facebook feed, on our Instagram feed, that is consistent with what we already believe, how does that influence our ability to um, engage in critical thinking when we come in contact with ideas and values and beliefs that aren't salient with what we believe? And so um, I do want to keep this brief because I know we have a lot of panelists uh, to get to and lots of questions, but those are the two large takeaways um, for me and, and looking at it from an interpersonal perspective. So thank you. Sorry, I need to unmute. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bergquist. Uh, next, our next panel panelist is uh, Dr. Mariam Betlamidza. Uh, Dr. Betlamidza is an assistant professor in CSUSB's Department of Communication Studies. She's the faculty advisor for the student no newspaper, the Coyote Chronicle, and her interests revolve around multimedia journalism, post-structural media studies, and social change. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Corrigan. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be part of this, uh, this panel because I think it's a very timely discussion, especially before the elections. Um, so um, I appreciate the comments made before me by our, my graduate student, Naim, uh, and my colleague, Dr. Berquist. Um, I agree with you on many of the issues, but um, for my short little, little kind of speech here, what I want to emphasize that I have two different, I wear two different hats as a, uh, a scholar and as a professor at CSUSB and in general, First, I am advisor for student newspaper Coyote Chronicle and my remarks for this film as the advisor for Coyote Chronicle are pretty straightforward. So this um, movie is an alarm bell that we need to do something differently, right? So we need to start um, behaving in a way that we are not addicted to social media and um, perhaps the solution, uh, and I would say the solution is to uh, to read local newspapers because they are dying. And if there is no local newspaper, uh, who will keep those who are in power accountable to what they're doing? So that's my a big takeaway as a advisor for Coyote Chronicle. And um, those of you who are listening right now, students, if you have never taken um, experiential learning previously called practicum classes, um, journalism practicum classes are, um, they sound intimidating, but once you start actually writing stories and once you see your story published and how much of a difference it makes, it is the, the, the biggest joy that uh, I would say one can experience, especially in the college. My another comment, um, the like other side, maybe even contradictory comment is that I am a post-structural scholar 
And the problem that I had with this movie is that it kind of treats us as, um, as if we are not able to think independently um, and make our own conclusions. Um, so it, it was very one-sided. Those of you who are studying media um, uh, immediately probably recognize that is um, technological determinist idea that is the main driving force in the movie. And it revolves around this idea of technological determinism as if there are no other um, uh, factors that influence what we do, right? So um, technological determinism along with the social constructivism, those are the main takeaways and there's no space left for critical cultural affirmative philosophy to contemplate uh, because in that moment of um, disruption and interruption, that is not just a moment for um, to be commodified, but it also opens up a moment for um, disrupting status quo and creating change. Uh, the change that uh, many images created, for example, this summer, the latest change, which is so troubling, was the image of George Floyd. If there was no social media, how would this, this protest would take probably longer to you know, gain its power and you know, to galvanize media attention? So that's my takeaway. It's not all one-sided and we all have power to change things. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Bedlamidza. Uh, our next panelist is uh, another graduate student from our Master of Arts in Communication Studies graduate program, uh, Lloydy Burma. Uh, uh, her interests revolve around journalism and digital culture, including cancel culture. Uh, Lloydy? Thank you, Dr. Corrigan. Thank you for everyone. I'm glad to be with you all here. Uh, my name is Lori, so I'm a second year uh, MA student in the Communication Studies program. Um, I've actually earned my BA here at CSUSB as well in mass communication, particularly in uh, multimedia production. Um, as Dr. Corrigan mentioned, my interests are in like journalism, uh, specifically like new, made, new mediated forms of storytelling and uh, narrative building. Uh, digital culture, social media, and cancel culture, which is now part of my thesis that I've been studying for about two years now. Um, Personally, for me, what I was seeing within the film and, and to answer some of the questions that were asked um, in terms of, you know, what does the film get right? Uh, what does it overlook? Uh, how can we create a more like just society and democracy? Um, in the realm of journalism, I was hoping to see uh, within the documentary, at least, uh, how organizations are sort of adapting to this new form of storytelling via social media. And in relation to that, tying social media organizations to this idea of financially constraining journalists in terms of advertising. Um, with digital culture, trying to understand uh, more about like the human processes in terms of the operation of algorithms, um, other than just like the manipulation of user psychology, but actually like what are the human values and opinions programmed into the construction of content, which I think uh, Kathy O'Neill, the data scientist actually drew more attention to. And trying to see uh, how social media you or social media organizations use algorithms to uh, pretty much proliferate trends and feeds. So like, what does it look like for a user to open Twitter, open Facebook, and have all of this information presented to them based on their needs, you know, quote, unquote. Um, additionally, uh, trying to look for more examination in terms of uh, what type of independent or more like democratic platforms uh, with interest to like user data privacy um, could be encouraged for users to try and at least try to understand in terms of becoming more conscientious of their digital footprint. Um, you know, thinking about certain policies that could, you know, potentially be instituted in terms of uh, making it mandated for like user reports and seeing your digital footprint, like maybe across the year or across a few months, et cetera, and all of that stuff. And then finally, in terms of cancel culture, um, with social media in particular, trying to examine like that nexus between like free speech, accountability, um, in terms of gathering individual data and seeing how we can still hold folks accountable for uh, the things that they do say online that may in fact be problematic. So that's exactly what I'm sort of thinking about with this film here. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Lloydy. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Shane Burrell. Uh, Shane Burrell is also a, uh, a master's student in the Communication Studies graduate program, uh, and he studies immersive environments, human-machine interactions, and Chicano theory. 
Hey everyone, uh, how's it going? As Dr. Corgan said, yes, I uh, study human uh, human machine interactions and immersive technologies, and uh, particularly in virtual reality. Um, <clears throat> I am working on um, like conceptualizing these concepts that I that I coined of like enrolling and de-rolling and like adapting to character identifications and what that means and what it is. Um, I I really appreciate what everyone has said so far. Um, I would like to kind of piggyback off to Dr. B, Dr. Burquest, how you doing? Um, in what she said about having long-term effects. Um, long-term effects is something that us in like the immersive technology environment or the immersive technology like uh, discipline is kind of what we're going for, right? Like we want to establish these long-term effects, but we also want to do it in such a way that it not only promotes society in a further advancement through technology, but we also look at it in a way that it can be harmful and hurtful. And what is that dynamic, right? And like establishing like this theory, this understanding of how immersive like technology actually has an effect on an individual and what that means. And I think this this uh, documentary actually brought that to light quite a bit is that not only do social media platforms do that in such like a subtle way, but they're using it in such a capitalistic way as Dr. Um, Betlamitsu said, <laughs> you know, like, we look at these like platforms and, and kind of like look at it in the sense of like social interaction and as, as a part of our personality but really what they're doing is like adapting to our own identity right and this documentary kind of brought that up as well is that when we look at one's identity we're looking at it in the sense of i am social media is a part of my life right it's a part of who i am it's a part of how i develop and move and establish friendships and establish um, relationships with individuals like we don't actually go out and like hit on people anymore we actually do that through an app we have dating apps for that right and and that is that has come that has been brought into our culture and so and so in understanding this um that's that's kind of like what i try to research and try to figure out is that that long-term establishment within technology and how technology is actually influencing us within our own society but also in our personal identity Right, like who are we without Facebook? Who are we without TikTok? Who are we without Twitter? And <clears throat> looking at that and like kind of reflecting on the film, we see that the film kind of touches on that, but also it's extremely contradictory, right? Because the film has been promoted to us through an algorithm that was built by Netflix. <laughs> so, so it's just like, who the hell are we, right? Like if we can't figure it out without Netflix to help guide us, then how do we bring bring that into our own selves, right? So, um, so that's just kind of my takeaway on that. Um, I hope to bring this up in discussion a little bit more, like further, and and kind of dig deeper. But thank you. All right, thank you, Shane. Uh, our our next panelist is uh, Ola uh, um, Ola Lawal. Uh, Ola is a graduate student, also in our Master of Arts in Communication Studies graduate program, and he studies media representations of Africa social media, marketing, and their effects. Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, like Dr. Corrigan said, my name is Ola. Um, I'm actually very passionate about anything Africa related, but for this one, I had to jump on and actually speak in this uh, conversation because um, it's crazy. Uh, before I go on, let me just start with a small, with a little course my mom used to tell me growing up. She used to say too much of anything is dangerous and unhealthy. I used to always argue about it with her, like, oh, what do you mean too much of anything? But basically in this case of social media, I believe it's very true. Like too much of social media is very dangerous. Um, for concerning the, uh, when I watched the documentary, The Social Dilemma, um, Jim Bodilard's story, Jim Bodilard's uh, 1981 story of uh, simulacra of simulation, simulacra of reality, it popped up to my mind and it made me realize like, oh, this is what he's talking about, how people substitute the actual reality for a kind of, fake created reality so that's the case with social media we have um uh one in the documentary there was a case where they showed uh the young girl who was sad about how much engagement she has with a post and it's just crazy how much power how much strength social media has in our lives like for um the class i'm taking this quarter i'm taking from 6003 with dr taylor i conducted an interview on um yeah the social media as a yastic of happiness and from my participants, I could tell like, yes, social media actually plays a very, very important role in so many people's lives. Like people, people just ignore it and act like, oh, it's just social media, but it's actually very strong and it's very, very powerful. Like uh, we saw the case of how it's influenced um, 
how it influenced uh, the protests in Egypt, how it influenced the protests in Tunisia. Uh, it's also the same thing happening right now in Nigeria. We have a protest in Nigeria, the ANSAS protest, which is currently going on. And it's actually like currently there's a debate as to whether it's the citizen journalism or it's social media that is making these protests currently going on so popular. And that's actually a topic of interest for me. That's why I decided to write on it for my thesis, like the role social media plays in the um, protest in Nigeria. So basically watching the documentary just brought about so many questions, just brought about so many questions and so many thoughts. Like it's crazy how they referred to, how they said uh, social media is like a drug and we the users are uh, the products. Like they said um, in the documentary, they said there are only two companies that refer to its consumers as users, which is the drug company and social media. So basically it's like, we, we just like commodities, we're like goods, we're like um, parts that are being sold. So it's just, a lot to talk about, but uh, due to time, I should stop here. Um, it's just nice talking to everyone. It's just nice in everyone's faces. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ola. Uh, our, our next panelist is a, a brand new professor here in the uh, Department of Communication Studies, uh, Theo Mazumdar. Uh, he studies uh, strategic and political communication, including conspiracy theories. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. I'm glad to be part of this excellent panel. Um, I'd like to pick up on something that was discussed briefly and insufficiently at the end of the film. And that is the optimism and hopefulness that marked the early stages of the internet. And this is absolutely true. Uh, the founding of the internet was filled with a kind of ut uh, utopian spirit. And by utopian, what we mean is simply that technology or internet based technologies will make society much better. Uh, that can be seen from the creation of the internet itself, a decentralized network of network instead of a centralized hub and spoke system, uh, to uh, Tim Berners-Lee and his decision not to seek a patent for his invention, the World Wide Web, uh, which we use to navigate uh, the internet. That was some 30 years ago. You see some glimpses of that utopian spirit uh, in the experts that were uh, featured in the movie especially talking about the beginning of the work. For example, Justin Rosenstein talking about his motives and priorities and in inventing the like button for Facebook. And then just to take one example, uh, we can see the benefits of the internet and social media, specifically in the Me Too movement, uh, which is now spread all around the world and has led to several law changes in several states here in the US. Of course, the flip side of the utopian view is the dystopian view. Uh, which is that technologies like social media are making society much worse. And this film is an exploration of social media from this dystopian view. And so there's a growing sense that the dystopian view of technology has, uh, is superseding the utopian view or has superseded the utopian view. So since uh, we are in the midst of an election and the dedicated election day is just a very short time away, a few days ago, uh, we can look at two examples from the world of politics, political polarization and conspiracy theories. Uh, in terms of political polarization, uh, there is conflicting evidence and that is key. We've got to um, actually look at what the research tells us, but some scholars have shown that social media usage can lead to increased polarization by reinforcing partisan political attitudes. That's really done through two uh, mechanisms. The first is selective exposure. And that is that we tend to pick new sources and information that align with our pre-existing views. The second is what's called homophily, that we tend to surround ourselves with people who share certain characteristics with ourselves. So selective exposure and homophily can lead to echo chambering. That is when users' beliefs are amplified because they're continually exposed to information that is in line with their views as they stand, which actually then reinforces those views. As we think about conspiracy theories, scholars say that they do not spread like wildfire. Instead, um, they stay within the communities of people who already agree with them. So Ethan Zuckerman calls QAnon, which you've all probably heard of, uh, an, an inevitable result of what he calls the unreal. And that is not that is when we no longer have a common shared reality, but instead we have different universes of different facts and interpretations. The result of unrealities is that it leads to doubt, cynicism, and then paralysis, like we see in political gridlock now. 
So the question that I'd like to pose today is that in the face of the so-called attention economy, surveillance capitalism and related phenomena, is it still possible to think of the internet and especially social media as being used to make the world better? In other words, is it still possible to have an optimistic view of technology? Thank you very much. Panelists is uh, uh, Shafiq Rahman. Uh, uh, Shafiq is the chair of the Department of Communication Studies, uh, and, uh, and and your interests, Shafiq, revolve around uh, international and intercultural communication. Uh, thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> I have only three minutes, so I just want to jump to the main points that I want to convey today. So as you know, this documentary features <clears throat> two groups of people, people who held really critical positions in social media as like engineers, designers, you know, marketers, and also academicians who study social media. So I just want to point out that they are not like panicked parents who are concerned about their children <laughs> spending too much time on social media or generally just alarmist that they don't, you know, they, and anything, anything new they, they see, they become alarmed. So they are serious people talking about serious issues. So they are, I, I would say, very credible. We might disagree, critique their position, but nonetheless, they are uh, very capable speakers on, the thing, on, the, uh, on what they were saying. So it's basically all of them, they try to tie social media with contemporary social ills mainly political fragmentation, disinformation, declining social uh, mental health. So they warn us that this, if unchecked, this thing can pose a existential, existential threat to us and can cause civil war. You know, you might be surprised. Willful ignorance, economic collapse, environmental degradation. So it's um, pretty alarming. So, and like some other speakers pointed out, particularly Dr. Bethlemidze, they came, they approached this issue from a um, technological perspective and spent a whole lot of time on the design of those technologies. Basically, they said that uh, the persuasive uh, psychology was infused in the design and uh, making those technology addictive and uh, there, as many speakers uh, uh, discussed, that their main goal is to expand the use. So therefore, features like tagging and all the other things were incorporated deliberately. So the more we use uh, the technology, the more information we provide about ourselves. And those informations are analyzed using sophisticated algorithm, uh, artificial intelligence. The objective is to make our behavior more predictable. According to one researcher who was quoted in the, in the documentary saying that our be, uh, behavior becomes gradual, slighted, um, Im, um, perceptible change occurs in our, uh, in our behaviors. Therefore, we are more sellable to the marketers. So, I mean, I mean this is technological determinism, but you can uh, argue they made some brief references about um, also that economic determinism, meaning that it is not the design totally, but it is also the business model. And, and also they reminded us that we have still, we have our agency that we can you know, stay away from social media, we can limit our change and everything. So I, my question, and I know that I'm running out of time, my question is that uh, whether a counter design is possible, like, like by hackers, by others. So that's the question. Whether we, this effect will level off, meaning that we will learn how to use the social media uh, and then effect will not be that great. And I want to end with, that, with a very optimistic uh, assertion, uh, paralleling what, uh, what has been said about globalization that another social media is possible. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rahman. Uh, our our uh, next panelist is Dr. Michael Salvador. Uh, Dr. Salvador is a professor in the Department of Communication Studies. His interests revolve around uh, rhetorical and environmental communication. Dr. Salvador. Thanks, Dr. Corgan. Uh, the earth has been floating through the universe for about 4 billion years. And the earliest humans uh, emerged about 150,000 years ago, and it's hard to pinpoint, but human 
symbolic ability, the ability to use symbols, uh, really blossomed about 50,000 years ago. So that means if you condense the entire ex existence of the earth into one day, human symbolic culture has been around for two seconds. And, and in two seconds, we have completely transformed this, this planet into what is now called the Anthropocene, right? Where every, every ecological aspect of the globe is impacted by human activity. So from an environmental perspective, uh, the social dilemma, the focus on social media is the apex of human symbolic evolution, right? The human's uh, symbolic ability has been our biggest strength and it has also been our biggest curse. Uh, from the earliest development of, of symbolic culture, we have been slowly separating ourselves from connection with nature. Uh, Ola talked earlier about how he was, uh, you know, the, the social dilemma documentary impressed upon him how much we live in a created reality. Well, that created reality has been around as long as symbols have been around. Uh, humans have just been evolving and developing more and more uh, captivating symbolic realities. And the social media now has just is just the ultimate in argumentation. We talk about reduction to absurdum, right? Uh, social media simply now takes us to the ultimate disconnect from nature where we're completely living in a virtual reality. And to this point, from the earliest development of religion to science to whatever a symbolic uh, formula you want to focus on, humans have never developed the ability to control it. Uh, we have always been the victim of our symbolic creations. We have never been the masters of our symbolic creations. I am not optimistic. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not fatalistic. Uh, but the, the, the global environmental crisis that we now face is not giving us a lot of time to get this figured out, right? We are in the midst of the largest uh, extinction rate in history. Uh, I can go on and on about the environmental problem. So we don't have a lot of time. And, uh, but, but from an environmental point of view, this is simply the, the ultimate uh, expression of humans completely being controlled by our symbolic creations instead of us controlling those symbolic creations. So that's the environmental perspective and I'm, I'm done. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Salvador. So I'll, I'll wrap things up with a, a couple thoughts that um, maybe relate to earlier ones uh, shared by our panelists. Uh, the, uh, I, I, I think it would be hard to watch the social dilemma and not be troubled, right? And I'm, I'm enthused that the film has started uh, the sort of conversations that it has, uh, including including this conversation, because obviously, um, you know, we, we might disagree about what the nature of the changes that are necessary in uh, our digital society might be. Uh, but obviously, the first step to making any changes is having a conversation and starting to wrap our heads around the nature of the problems, right? Um, but I think if there's a, 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 a sort of a beef I had with the film, it was in the, the rather narrow or limited discussion of how social change might unfold. And I, I study political economy of communication. One of our big questions is how does social change happen and how do we change society and media? And uh, the film largely couches the question of social change around um, what I would consider sort of uh, techno liberalism, the idea that we might come up with new technological arrangements uh, that, that can work our way out of the problem. Uh, the, the film characterizes it as humane tech, um, which is a, a, a lovely idea, but it also, uh, you know, we, we operate in a power laden society that uh, places real constraints on the capacities of. Uh, of people and groups to go ahead and and create those sorts of um, you know technologically driven social changes. Uh, the other sort of thing that you see unfolding in the credits of the film is the idea that we can make individual changes, right? Which we can make some individual changes, um, but at the same time, the idea that some individual changes will result in social uh, transformation of our media system and society um, seems to me uh, you know woefully under under thought out, right? And so we're we're not going to get some. Sort 
sort of Chrome browser extension that's going to facilitate the, the sort of changes we need to the, the, the media system or society. And so, I, you know, from a political econo economic perspective, we, we also we need to think about what sort of collective action uh, reform, political reform uh, might lead to the sort of digital society uh, that we would like to live in. All right. And uh, these are not new questions around media studies. We've been looking at media reform for decades, and there have been big developments around media reform organizations like Free Press that have really done a terrific job organizing the public to make media policy an issue and then um, enacting and, and fighting for change in those areas. Uh, probably one of the, the topics that many of you are familiar with is uh, the issue of net network neutrality. All right. And media reform organizations have led that movement to try to protect network neutrality against, you know, really sort of daunting political and economic odds. All right. Um, and it hasn't always been a, you know, a successful, it's been one step forward, two steps back, but that it's a political struggle. And, you know, there's nothing natural or inevitable about about our social media landscape or about our media landscape more generally. And as a result, these are things that we can change, not just the technologies, right, but the systems in place, the political systems in place to finance, own, and regulate those media uh, systems that, that that mediate our society. Um, the thing I would, I'm very encouraged about is that these movements for media reform have started to dovetail uh, in really interesting ways with developments around social justice. And, uh, um, and it, one, one thing that's going on this week, and I'll share a link in the chat, uh, is a, um, a series of events called uh, Disrupt Disinfo uh, that are being produced by uh, the organization Media Justice, which looks at moments of um, uh, of collective activism around social justice issues and around media reform, because whatever your top issue is, right, whether, whether it's the environment, whether it is uh, um, uh, criminal justice, whether it is uh, voting rights, uh, whether it is equal pay for equal work, um, the capacity for democratic change in any of those areas also hinges on the media system that represents ideas about those issues. All right, so I, I'd encourage you keep whatever your top issue is, your top, uh, but consider looking into media reform as an important area of, um, of, of activism that you can get involved in and that you can learn more about going forward. So uh, that's my, my, my little take on, uh, on, on the social dilemma uh, and the societal dilemma. All right, so uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, turn things over to questions from our audience. We've gotten some great questions uh, through the Q&A function. And if you haven't uh, submitted a question and you'd like to, please just go ahead and click on that Q&A link on Zoom and feel free to, uh, to submit a question to our panelists or to the, the panel as a whole. So uh, I wanted to, we've got a, a couple related questions here around social media uh, and identities that um, uh, perhaps uh, either Shane or Ola or others could, could respond to. Uh, so one question is, um, does social media influence our identities? And, it, and if so, in what ways does it do so? Um, so uh, Shane or Ola, do you wanna uh, tackle that or, or someone else? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm I'm happy to do that. Uh, I think we actually we, we skipped uh, Dr. Uh, Oregel if, if he wanted to give oh, his I'm, introduction I'm, really quickly. I am I am so <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, Roberto. So yes. uh, let me uh, let me go back to the analyst <laughs> list. Uh, I I my my sincere apologies. So uh, uh, Professor uh, Roberto Oregel is a, a assistant professor in CSUSB's Department of Communication Studies. Uh, he focuses on documentary filmmaking and social justice. Sorry, again. Oh, thanks, guys. I, I was already going to put it on neutral and just listen to the conversation here. <laughs> so um, really, what I just want to point out a few things is um, I'm coming from like the director, producer. How do you make a film like this? How do you actually reach uh, an audience, a broader audience? How do you expand it? How does a family watch this film? How do uh, schools at different levels watch this film. So these are some of the ideas of what the producer director is going through in trying to make a film like this. It's a very complicated, very hard film because they're dealing with very abstract topics. And currently my class is, is pitching their ideas for their final project. And you know they come to my class and they pitch their ideas. We wanna do this or we wanna do this. And ultimately I ask them, what project are you most passionate with? 
And the second thing is, what project could you actually capture uh, amazing footage? Because ultimately, this is a film. This is a medium that it has to be visual. So I say, go with the one that you're most passionate. Go with the film documentary that you could actually capture beautiful images. How could you tell the story in with images? Um, really quick. So these were some of the things that the director, producers are going through in this in this film. How do we tell the story? How do we make, make this film relatable? And um, in doing that, obviously, they first they capture all their talking heads, their interviews. That's one part of it. And then the second thing is, so there's like two films within the movie. The second thing is they actually write a script. There's a narrative film within this film, and they weave these two forms together, which makes it a pretty successful film. Let me just uh, share with you a quick slide or, uh, yeah. And basically, and you see these filmmakers and they get inspiration from uh, Hollywood. And these are some of the films that you could directly see influencing uh, the storytelling of this film. So we have Inside and Out, uh, Inside Out, we have The Big Short, we have Truman, uh, the Truman Show, we have Requiem for a Dream. There's a whole sequence on how uh, social media is addictive and it's like a drug. This is reference. The Matrix, it's obvious. It's all in there in this documentary. The good, the bad, and the ugly. This is the scene where the character, after three days, he's battling between getting off of, uh, ha not having access to his phone. There's that confrontation. Should he go and you know break his contract with his mother? And there's that sort of thing. They use uh, Ennio Morricone sort of uh, music uh, soundscape. Uh, manufacturing consent, it's sort of the same ideas, topics that we're sort of talking about. How is media, how are ideas manufactured in order for uh, people sort of to, you know, to, to if affect their thinking? Um, and really quick, uh, I'd like to address this. Hundreds, uh, Chomsky's quote, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent every year to control the public mind. And that's happening, that's, ha that's been happening for a long time and it's currently happening now. Uh, just one really quick, recently I saw a documentary called Carlos Alvarez playing with fire. Here's a painter who is also dealing with technology and he has his, his artistic career takes off when he actually creates this beautiful painting of, of LA freeway and a car crash. Um, and again, this is uh, him talking about this. I also like to compare it to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where ultimately the creature turns on its master. The car crash to me was an image that conveyed how technology can get out of control and maybe even destroy us. And the last film that we sort of also reference within this, this film is uh, Frankenstein, the digital Frankenstein. Can we control the monster? Thank you guys very much. Thank you again. And sorry, uh, I apologize again for, for having skipped you earlier. Now that I look at the chat, I see that everybody was trying to like wave their arms, you know, <laughs> vigorously to get my attention that I had, uh, I missed you. So uh, again, my apologies. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll turn to some questions. So I had posed a question just before we, uh, we, we skip back to panelists, which was about uh, social media and identities. We've had several folks that have asked questions about, uh, about identities uh, and, and, uh, and the role of social media in shaping our identities. Uh, we've got several panelists that, uh, that have all uh, hit, on, hit on this issue in different ways. So does anyone want to respond to, to sort of a, a question about how social media shapes our identities. And uh, there, there's a, a related question that if, if we didn't have uh, the internet, um, might our personas be, uh, be, be different in, uh, in, in contemporary society? So uh, uh, Shane, uh, Ola, uh, maybe um, uh, Gretchen, anyone want to pull that? I can jump in and just um, a, a couple of thoughts and then hand it off to um, Shane. I think he was uh, starting to make a point um, previously when we started to talk about this question. But, you know, it's really interesting when you think about it, because I, the way that, you know, when we communicate, we are our identities. And so it's a reciprocal process. And so when you look at the way that we're using our social media, it's, you know, 
we're attra- we're it's helping develop our identity, yes, and we're communicating our identity to others, but it, it's also very um, much dictating um, our self concept and how we um, how we internalize that. And so I back to and I mentioned this earlier, but you know there's there's kind of these two levels, right? There's this macro level and there's this micro level. And so there's the way that we communicate our identities to others when we're actually using it, but there's also the way that we internalize it in our self concept. And um, I think it was Jonathan Haidt was the was the scholar that touched on this in the in the film, but um, where he talked about um, the link between some of the mental uh, negative mental health outcomes and social media usage. And so. Um, you know, just to kind of start the ball rolling on that question, it's a very broad question, but the way that I think about it and the way that I approach it is from an interpersonal perspective. And so um, looking at it as a reciprocal process and um, just being mindful of how that usage is going about um, influencing your self-concept because there's a lot of negative outcomes. Um, and so that's a really broad question, but that's just kind of a, a couple of thoughts to get the ball rolling on this. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, anyway. I really, I like that idea. The idea of talking about self-concept is extremely important and it's something that we look at in immersive technologies as well. Um, <clears throat> but looking at this from like a Chicano theory perspective, we have to like also understand that the way that we shape our identities is something that is historical and it's generational in, in its growth, right? And just because we're moving to like in, a virtual platform instead of having it like as something that's personal like from talking to person to person uh doesn't mean that we have to lose that that we're losing this idea or like this this implementation of colonization right and i think dr liliana gallegos brought this up in one of the q a's that <clears throat> yes social media does change our roles right and how we like act and how we're interacting with individuals like that are online and and because we're doing that and Dr. Burquest brought this up it's like we're bringing this like self-efficacy into like that idea as well and it's it's shaping like who we are as we take on multiple roles it changes our identity because our identity is essentially something that's fixed right it's something that can't really be changed very quickly but the roles that we establish do have an effect on us and also <clears throat> thinking about it um, from a colonization perspective is that just because like we go through like racism and all that stuff in the outside world doesn't mean that it's not gonna happen on a social media platform. And we've seen that as it as like the BLM movements have come out, like people have been overtly racist on uh, social media platforms and then been docked for it. And doxing is, you know, where you show you like family members, your boss, all the racist comments and all the stuff that you're putting out there inside of like on social media platforms and then they're coming back for you. So <clears throat> It is a super broad question, but yes, like we do take on multiple, multiple roles, but we also still have to understand that there is a hierarchical perspective that is being implemented on platforms, no matter where you are. So that's my take. Thank you, Shane. Uh, you know, and this, uh, you know, some of the, the, you mentioned some of the comments we see in, in social media contexts uh, circulating on these platforms that are absolutely tied in with uh, um, uh, dimensions of, uh, of patriarchy and white supremacy. And, uh, you know, one interesting development that's happening in the, uh, uh, on Capitol Hill, I believe this week, is a conversation about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, uh, which is basically the policy that protects platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera, from liability associated with the comments that are shared on these platforms, right? So we've got uh, these, these dimensions of, uh, of inequitable uh, and unjust social structures also being tied in with, uh, you know, policy dynamics that are unfolding uh, right now, right? And so it, this illustrates that also there's nothing natural about these arrangements, right? Uh, they're, they're a function of, uh, of political developments, both political in the, um, you know, uh, legislative sense, but also political in the, in the general sense of, of power. Um, hey, there was a, a question that I, uh, was directed to uh, uh, Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Burma um, uh, that was is related to these topics, which uh, the question, Lloyd, was uh, in the documentary, uh, female image and online bullying were examined. Uh, do you feel that depiction of women has become increasingly harmful from previous years and in what ways? Um, Lloyd, do you want to um, take a stab at that? 
Sure, I was actually like typing up this response, trying to get my thoughts together. Um, but I was thinking more so like, of course, without like the data present, I can't necessarily present like the quantitative extremities of what that actually looks like. But thinking about how um, for some folks and particularly for women, how they view themselves online in relation to others. And I think that can be said of any individual, but for instance, thinking of like the platform tools like likes and retweets, for instance, um, if an individual shares like a selfie, like an image of themselves, right, or something that they're doing, um, is it indicative of like admiration to that extent? And what does that look like for individuals who view that same image and say, hey, I may not have that same amount of, um, sort of engagement from other folks that could be indicative that, you know, like they like what I do or they like me or something, something of that nature. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with individual insecurity at that extent. But then again, you also have to think of the platform and how the tools that are present actually proliferate that. But then on the other side of the coin, I don't want to necessarily like just denote it to uh, like harmful depictions because I see at least from how I use social media and what I'm seeing on like my feed personally, a lot of individuals and particularly women um, more so using the platform to self-actualize themselves and sort of assert their individual an individual individuality on the platform rather than sort of delineating to there are only certain aspects of like beauty that can be present so like thinking of certain like profiles and thinking of certain users who for instance say you know support body positivity or you know sharing links of themselves in terms of uh using other platforms like what i'm seeing right now particularly on twitter like only fans and all of those sort of depictions it's like Yes, you could say that in some instance, there is some harm in terms of at least what individuals can see related to like their insecurities and the depictions of others. But then at the same time, there's still that notion that you can use the platform to like empower yourself. So it's like this weird sort of, I don't want to call it a balance, but this sort of nexus between like, okay, what is considered harmful and then what is considered empowering. That's what I'm thinking in terms of what I'm seeing online. But I know it's much more complicated than that. Thank you, Lloydie. Uh, Ola, you wanted to jump in, right? Yes, correct. Um, according to what uh, Lloydie said, uh, there was an aspect which Lloydie, which um, when Lloydie was speaking that, brought, that came to my attention, it's um, the, the term Snapchat dysmorphia whereby people go through surgeries to look like um, filtered photos. I believe that's like, that shows how much influence social media has on the, on the um, I'm trying not to be offensive here or trying to be plain. Oh, just, let me just say on uh, the female gender, it shows how much influence social media has on the female gender. Like it's like, it also has influence on the male counterpart, but it's like, um, how can I describe it? Like um, we tend to see more of we tend to hear more of like from the Snapchat, from the uh, Social Dilemma documentary, it talked about how there was an increase in the number of suicide rates in preteen girls and uh, females and girls generally or ladies generally. So I believe um, social media has like an increase in, like I, I know there are no, um, there's no research to support my claim, but from the movie and from basic observation, and uh, a discussion I had with a friend, with a female, with a friend who is a female also, I believe uh, social media has this harmful effect on women. But I believe it's also based on, if you let it, like if you allow it. Um, Dr. Muktaseb also asked a question in the chat whereby she asked what's the difference between the Facebook dilemma and the social dilemma? Like what's the difference between both of them? I believe the major difference is, it's funny how um, Netflix was talking about the effects of social media and the algorithms, but they fail to talk about their own algorithms. Like basically Netflix employs the use of algorithms to show us movies, to send us notifications, to they basically also steal us away from whatever it is you're doing. One time you're busy doing something, then the next thing you see is, have you watched whatever, whatever, whatever. It also employs the same algorithms. It's like, a, net, it's like Netflix is double-faced. Like it shows us, it's like a double standards. Yeah, it tells us, it critiques, social media. Meanwhile, it's also doing the same thing, employing the same algorithms to steal our attention, to drive us away from what we're doing. Like it's, 
it's actually a very deep conversation. So I believe the major difference between the Facebook dilemma and the social and the social media, the social dilemma is the fact that the Facebook dilemma sort of like tackled every sphere of how Facebook is harmful and also helpful. But for the social dilemma, they only tackled social media. They forgot about entertainment, TV shows about entertainment apps and the likes. Meanwhile, they are also very, very harmful because they also employ basically the same algorithms, if not a more complex one. So uh, to me, I believe that's the major difference between both of them. Uh, so uh, jumping off of, of a point you just made there, Ola, we've, we've had a few questions about uh, whether social media can be beneficial to democracy, right? I, I think the last uh, 20 minutes or, show, or so of the film uh, gives you the um, may, perhaps you know, justifi justifiable uh, impression that uh, democracy is on the run across the globe, right? Um, but uh, is, is there anything our, our panelists wanna share about uh, the, the use of these tools for, uh, for, for social and democratic purposes that are perhaps more laudable here, right? So uh, um, does anyone want to share their thoughts on, on that, that flip side of, the, uh, uh, of social media's potential, democratic and social justice uh, purposes? I just want to, you know, again, <clears throat> I taught a class uh, a couple of times in another institution about social media and the process of democratization. So I, you know, uh, uh, I, I just want to say that there are like significant amount of literature on that particular topic. And people particularly who are very enthusiastic about the earlier, like what uh, Dr. Mazumdar said that in the beginning phase of internet, that internet is a huge tool for connectivity, participation, you know, all kinds of thing. So, and also there are some empirical evidence also, like books have been written about Arab Spring and social media. And I'll just say one thing though, and that's probably the optimistic side of it, even though this, uh, uh, this documentary kind of um, paints a very gloomy picture of like how a handful of designers in collaboration with uh, the, you know, or, you know, working toward, uh, to, you know, for, uh, what is the word, for a capitalistic goal in mind, that design a technology that is addictive, that is causing so much harm, control, you know, breaching pr privacy, all kinds of negative th thing. But on the other side, I think this technology also, I think to some extent, open source, and there are some unintended uses, like some of the things, some of the features that the designers used and others, particularly pro-democracy activist hackers, and they modified the use a little bit to make it more suitable for social movement and that they used it in different parts of the world. So that is one of the encouraging sign. And, and, and also later, I think uh, those literature also you know, point out that uh, when particularly in uh, during Arab Spring and other parts of the world, people participated and the, you know, the uh, either the some of the tech companies provided that information to some of the oppressive rulers or somehow they got information and then it became a tool for repression. So, I mean, the point I'm trying to make is there is no easy, or a very straightforward to, uh, to, to things to say about social media. They, they are so complex, their uses are so multifaceted. So, but there are empirical evidence. That's what I'm trying to say that social media were widely used in some of the contemporary social movements. Some of them are successful, some are not that successful. So yeah, I'll stop and I'm positive there are others who can comment on this. Uh, I'd like to agree with uh, Dr. Rachman, uh, and that is uh, that the 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 reality is complex with regard to um, whether or not the internet and social media can promote democracy and help democracy. I think it's very important not to give into a a very convenient um, technologically deterministic dystopian vision of technologies, um, with the understanding that those types of views have accompanied every major technology that has been introduced. For example, people were deathly afraid when the telephone was introduced that uh, in the Victorian era that young women were going to uh, 
uh, be led astray and be having all manner of conversations with young men, which would, uh, you know, have awful implications for their character. So I think it's very important not to give into convenient narratives. Um, there, are, if I spoke briefly about political uh, polarization. There's some research also that the use of social media can actually uh, increase the diversity of views because some research has found that people often do, let's say on Facebook, see a wider range of perspectives than they would get through uh, other types of media. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think uh, a, a cautionary flag is, a, is appropriate before making sort of grand sweeping um, pronouncements on how damaging certain technologies are for, for things like democracy. There are uh, some, some newer technologies of, uh, as have been alluded to. Um, the indie web is, uh, is sort of a loose uh, collection of ind independently uh, run sites. There are tools, tools like micro.blog uh, which is a, uh, an open source uh, platform, kind of similar to Twitter. There is a, a technology called Mastodon, which is again, a kind of open source uh, ad-free um, social networking alternative. Uh, and it has you know, over, over 4 million uh, users now. Um, so, so I believe that there are some tools that are, that are less corporate um, than the ones that we're so used to. But I also do believe generally we should, we should follow the research in terms of potential damage or benefits caused, caused by social media and not just jump to convenient conclusions. And obviously uh, no, no reason we can't try to create a, a, a better media system while, while minimizing the, uh, the negative impacts, right? So uh, we've had a, a few comments here in the, in the chat. Uh, Amanda notes that from an LGBT perspective, the internet has been amazing for helping people find their community, for instance. Um, and uh, Allie noted in the chat that, uh, uh, that the social dilemma doesn't necessarily present or pretend to be uh, you know, a fuller balanced view on these, uh, on these topics. And I think that's, that's part of the reason that we're having this conversation is that there's, there's more to discuss here, right? And uh, I, I, I should note that I, I turned to Facebook to create a Facebook event for this conversation, right? And, uh, and, and have people on our chat that are from not just CSUSB, but other uh, institutions that are, that are here, you know, talking and thinking through things. And, uh, and certainly that would have been extremely difficult to do, uh, at least with the, uh, at the scale and quickness that we did this, um, you know, wanting to try and have this conversation in advance of, uh, of Tuesday's election, right? So, um, you know, these are, uh, th these are certainly um, complicated issues. And any changes that are going to come to social media are going to be changes that are discussed in <laughs> and probably mobilized through social media too, right? And so this is a you know a, 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 an, a, an interesting contradiction of these uh, these tools and their and their uses. Uh, we've we've got some questions here uh, about you know so what what, what do we do, right? Uh, and one question is about regulation, right? And I think this is maybe a you know a, a touchy subject. We assume that uh, the media tends uh, that the media should be unregulated in, uh, uh, in, in, in the US. Uh, but you know, is this a place where regulations and policies uh, uh, should or could play a role right, in creating a, uh, a more democratic media system? Uh, Rachel raised the question of whether, uh, and uh, we had another um, uh, person in the chat ask about this too, whether uh, the one solution might be to tax uh, data collection processes and to use the those taxes uh, for, um, uh, for 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 pro -so social purposes, uh, and so I wanted to raise the question with our our panelists: Is 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 this stuff uh, stuff that regulation has a role in? I will just phrase it: not regulation. I would say more additional consumer protection. Like they are, uh, I mean, definitely that's a very legitimate area to, uh, I mean, it, you can definitely government Congress will have to act so that we as, uh, you know, users of those media individuals, our privacy are more protected, uh, protected. We are, we have more control. I would probably route that, uh, into, uh, you know, into that area, not <laughs> regulating media because that's, I know I agree. That's a very touchy subject here in this country. So, but protecting consumers, 
I think is a very legitimate area that uh, we can, all of us, we can work. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Uh, I would say that um, we do have some form of regulation, even if it is like a social form of regulation. We have like the anonymous group or like a group of anonymous hackers. Um, we have uh, white white mage coders is what uh, they kind of talk them uh, talk about them as like white mage hackers. And when they actually go into corporations and change their algorithms so that they're not collecting personal data and distributing it out that, out that way. Um, but I think if we're thinking about like a political perspective, we have to also understand that like the politicians that are representing us in Congress and in, uh, in the House um, or in the Senate in the House, uh, we have to also understand that they don't know technology. So when you're telling individuals to vote on regulations on technology, when they don't even understand what an algorithm is and what it can do and the harm that it has, then that's when we come into like the social platform of it, right? And we have like almost like a social chopping block. And I think Lloydie would be able to talk about this a little bit better because she studies cancel culture, but uh, essentially like, yeah, like that's, that we've kind of taken that sort of environment of, of like who's doing bad things and allowing like the social platforms to take action on that. So, I mean, I agree with Dr. Rahman, but also if you're gonna vote on something you don't know shit about, then, then why do it? So, Lloydie, did you want to um, follow up on, on this and Shane, Shane uh, introduce you to the conversation? Yeah, uh, sure. So at least from the perspective of cancel culture and what I've been trying to study and understand for like the past two years now is trying to see how you users are basically configuring accountability within the online space. Uh, so a lot of it has been, at least from what I'm seeing in terms of like the process itself, is that someone is held in contempt, right? And then whatever digital footprint that they have online, through social media, through any other platform that may exist, users gather that information, that evidence, quote unquote, and basically present it within a public forum and say, hey, you know, so-and-so has said these very racist or, you know, bigoted or sexist, homophobic, whatever the case may be, and are sort of asking other users, how can we hold said person accountable? Does that look like perhaps disrupting their finances? Or I believe even uh, Shane mentioned earlier the idea of doxing, sharing this information about their personal lives, uh, like where they live, where they work, who they associate with, and having some sort of action to like basically like penalize them for that. And in a way that al allows them or the person that's held in contempt to know that, sure, you may have that protection of free speech, right? You can say literally like anything you want to, but it doesn't make what you say right to that extent. And I think that's what I've heard, at least within um, the hearing yesterday between like Zuckerberg, Dorsey and uh, Pichai uh, for the, the science and uh, science commerce. And I think it's a transportation like hearing this idea between again, tying that back to what Shane was saying with like, you know, senators trying to understand this whole idea of like data and privacy and free speech online and like, well, how can we have some sort of like protection for users? What does that even look like? I think only one senator admitted that they were like a data scientist at one point, but everyone else was sort of like hooting and hollering about like, this is wrong and we have to regulate it and you have to be responsible. But at the same time, you have Zuckerberg, Dorsey and Pichai saying, hey, we, we're trying to do the best we can based on our value, but what does that, like, we don't have all the answers. We have to still rely on like the algorithms and we have to teach the algorithms and we have to build the algorithms, but like no one really is saying how the algorithm, how the algorithms even work and more so at least admitting to the fact that they are, are still in control of how the algorithms are actually deployed. So it's a very like interesting sort of like, I don't know, like weird space to be in at this at this point. I'd just like to comment very briefly uh, on this. I, I think uh, this matter of regulation is one of the most important questions, it really boils down to one of two options, which is the government or the social media companies themselves. In terms of the government, juris, uh, you know, legislation and jurisprudence is always going to lag behind the changes to technologies themselves. And of course, we know that um, priorities can change with different administrations. For example, the FCC's posture regarding network neutrality changed under the Trump, Trump administration, changed from that 
uh, that the position had held under the Obama administration. So that leaves social media companies themselves and uh, just the sheer amount of data, are we really gonna ask them to make judgments on what should be taken down and what should be left up? There's been a lot of criticism recently on, uh, on, on about Twitter for taking down the, uh, the Hunter Biden story for, for not keeping that the link to the uh, New York Post uh, story about Hunter, um, Hunter Biden's supposed uh, laptop and images on his laptops. So, I mean, it just seems that there's no great answer there because both of those two main options are extremely problematic. And if I may hear, uh, you know, one thing to also keep in mind is those, those same confused legislators are also major recipients of, uh, uh, of campaign, uh, campaign support from the very companies companies that are sitting in front of them hearing uh, their uh, um, uh, their testimony. Uh, the, the big tech firms are right up there with uh, big oil and the defense industries. Uh, in, in many respects, the big tech companies have become defense industry contractors, for instance, around virtual reality uh, and, uh, and, and immersive uh, technologies that, uh, you know, make them very much part of the uh, you know, the military industrial complex with all those same problems around democracy and commerce getting wrapped up together. Um, if I may say, suggest one regulatory development that, or proposal that I find really interesting is the proposal to tax uh, the data collection um, proceeds of these firms and to use those tax proceeds to support uh, independent newspapers that have been uh, crushed by the social media companies uh, 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 collection of advertising revenue um, over the past uh, decade or so. And so, you know, that's an interesting uh interesting proposal uh, to try to uh, ameliorate the woes of our contemporary um, uh, media and information landscape. Um, we are we are over our projected time here for this uh, this panel uh, and it's been a really uh, great pleasure to, uh, to to talk with all the, the panelists and to get such great questions from our from our audience members. Um, I, I would like to just first of all thank everybody for uh, uh, who was involved in, in producing this panel, but also everybody who participated in this panel uh, here. Um, if, uh, uh, if, if we want to uh, have an extended conversation here about the, these topics, um, I'd encourage you, uh, we, can, we can have some of this conversation on that Facebook event page uh, that we created, but obviously also we've got the capacity to start some email threads uh, and even continue these conversations in our classes. So uh, uh, thank you all very much for your for for, for your time today. And uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share uh, thoughts about the film and the topics. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.